In this video, we're going to look at how to draw Lewis structures for covalent compounds. So we know that a compound is covalent if the elements that make it up are non-metals. So for example, when I have hydrogen and oxygen, both of these elements are non-metals. Um, remember, we can tell whether an element is a metal or a non-metal by finding its position on the periodic table. So um, in water, hydrogen and oxygen share their electrons so that each hydrogen atom gets two, a duet, and the oxygen atom gets eight, an octet. So um, when I have two hydrogen atoms, there's only one shown here, but there would be another one also that has one electron, then you can see that this hydrogen atom wants to have two, and right now it only has one. And the oxygen atom wants to have uh, eight, and right now it only has six. I'm going to draw in this other H here. There we go. So there's one missing here and one missing here, right? Because the oxygen wants to have four pairs or eight electrons, and each hydrogen wants to have two. So the way that uh, this is satisfied is that this electron kind of gets shared with hydrogen, and then hydrogen would have two, and this electron kind of gets shared with oxygen, and then I'd, oxygen would have a, a pair. So, uh, oops, that's not the right one. So hydrogen would share this one, and oxygen would share this one. And then what we end up creating um, when these atoms share electrons, instead of stealing and giving away electrons, like ionic compounds, we get something like this down here, where uh, each atom now has a full valence shell. Each atom is satisfied. So the electrons that are in between elements, those are called, that's called a bonding pair of electrons. So these two are bonding electrons because they're holding the H and the O together. And these two are bonding electrons because they're holding the H and the O together on this side. But these two electrons down here, they're not in between two atoms. They're just hanging out by the O, by the oxygen. And these two up here, same thing. They're just hanging out by the oxygen. These are called lone pairs or non-bonding pairs because they are uh, only associated with oxygen. These electrons don't spend any of their time around any of the other atoms. They're just stuck on the atom um, th th to which they're associated, so the ones here on top and bottom. This is another way of kind of representing the way these electrons get split up. So oxygen gets to use all eight. This red circle here shows that oxygen is using all eight of the electrons. Remember, it only brought in six, but hydrogen, each hydrogen had one. So oxygen had six, and then seven, and then eight with both hydrogens. So now that there's eight electrons around oxygen, oxygen gets to use all eight of those. And so oxygen has an octet, just like a noble gas would. So that makes oxygen very stable in this, um, in this configuration. And hydrogen, hydrogen is too small to have eight electrons around it. So hydrogen can only hold two electrons around it. So this blue circle shows that hydrogen gets to use both of these two electrons, both of the bonding electrons between hydrogen and oxygen. Same thing with this hydrogen. It gets to use both of those electrons. So you see the oxygen has eight within the red circle, and each hydrogen has two. But these two right here are being shared because those are inside of the hydrogen circle and they're inside of the oxygen circle. So I get to count those two electrons twice. Same with these. These two electrons count twice. They count for oxygen, satisfying oxygen's octet. And these two electrons also count towards hydrogen for satisfying hydrogen's duet. So I get to count them twice. That's what being shared means. If I was looking at a, an ionic compound, is like the one that we drew in the last video. So remember, magnesium has two valence electrons and bromine has seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
six, seven. So in this compound, they don't share. It doesn't look the same as it does down here. So what happened, remember, is that magnesium gives away its electron to bromine, and this magnesium gives away its electron oops, to bromine down here to make a pair. And so um, like in the, uh, with hydrogen and water, we showed that the um, hydrogen was also sharing with the oxygen. There was an arrow that was coming back. That's not happening in this case. The bromine is not going to share its electron with magnesium. It's just going to steal magnesium's electron. So what happens? What does that end up looking like? Well, magnesium loses this one because bromine steals it, and it loses this one because bromine steals it. And then bromine gets a pair and gets another pair here. And then this shell for bromine and this shell for bromine, they're a closed shell. This is negative, an anion. This is negative, anion. And this magnesium in the middle lost two electrons. So it is now two plus, and it has its own shell. So look, in an ionic compound, the shells do not overlap because there's no sharing of electrons. Those two electrons are all bromines that stole an electron from magnesium. It's not sharing its electrons with magnesium. Same with the bromine on this side, it stole magnesium's electron. So um, ionic compounds have no overlapping spheres. The electrons have been completely transferred. But covalent compounds, those electrons can rightly be said to belong to both hydrogen and oxygen. Those electrons are hydrogens, and those electrons are oxygens. They're both. OK. Um, when two atoms share two pairs of electrons, the result is called a double covalent bond, or sometimes just a double bond. So when I have um, hydrogen and oxygen, we showed that the way they come together is by hydrogen. One hydrogen atom shares with this single electron to make a single bond to hydrogen. And one hydrogen atom shares with this single electron to make another single bond to hydrogen. So two single bonds to two hydrogen atoms. But when oxygen is bonding with another oxygen, then I have this unpaired electron can pair with this unpaired electron. And this one here can pair with this one here. So then they share, these two are shared. That's one pair that's shared. And these two are shared. That's another pair. Maybe it kind of looks like this. When they are shared, they go in between the two atoms. So Whenever I have two electrons in between two atoms, I can draw a line between that and say that's a bond. That's one single bond. But now there's another pair down here. So I can draw a line like that. That's a double bond. There are four electrons in between these two atoms now. Two, and then the other pair, four. So then it ends up looking like this. And if we draw our circles, our circles look like this. The four electrons that are in the middle, now it's not just two electrons that this oxygen gets to share. It's all four of them. So this oxygen has eight, two, four, six, eight. And its circle looks like this. This is the sphere that says that all the, all the electrons within this sphere belong to this oxygen. And all the electrons within this sphere belong to this oxygen. And since these electrons are in both spheres, that means they belong to both oxygens. They're being shared, shared electrons. So again, how do we know if something is going to be ionic, where the spheres don't overlap, and the electrons have been transferred completely, or if a compound will be covalent and the electrons are being shared? Well, it has to do with whether these atoms are metals or nonmetals. And remember, a covalent bond is one where both atoms are nonmetal. Okay, and 
we can share one pair of electrons, single bond, two pairs of electrons, double bond, three pairs of electrons, triple bond, triple covalent bond. So nitrogen, for example, let's take a step back from this picture and show nitrogen. And nitrogen has five valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five. I start to pair them up after the fourth one. So that means that nitrogen has one, two, three single electrons and one pair of electrons, five altogether. So my other nitrogen, I do the same thing. One, two, three, four, and then I pair them up, five. Doesn't matter where the pairs go as, as long as there's three single and one pair on each atom. So now I have every single electron wants to make a pair. So you see I can pair these two up and they'll make a pair. Then these two single ones here can make a pair and these two single ones here can make a pair. So when I scooch these two atoms close to, to each other, I put all six of these electrons, right? Two, four, six. All six of those electrons go in the middle so that means that all the electrons in between two atoms are being shared by both of those atoms. So this N, oh, I just, I'm trying to draw it over here, I guess. So here's this sphere. And here's this sphere. Right, so now this nitrogen is sharing all six of these electrons in the middle. And this nitrogen is also sharing those six. So this one has two, four, six, eight, and two, four, six, eight. So I get to count the electrons in the middle twice. They're the ones that are in both spheres are shared. And we're going to see that we don't really draw Lewis structures with uh, dots, we, when we draw bonding pairs, the bonding pairs are not drawn like dots. The bonding pairs are drawn like sticks. But the non-bonding pairs are still drawn like dots. So sticks, bonding, the ones that are shared, dots, non-bonding. So covalent compounds are a bit different than ionic compounds because um, the, having electrons be shared implies that the electrons must be in between the two atoms. And when I'm drawing a, a molecule that might have more than one atom attached to it, so um, H2O, for example, The electrons that are being shared between H and O, these electrons here and these electrons here, they can't just be anywhere around those atoms. They have to uh, be in a very specific spot so that H2O molecules always kind of have this shape. They always kind of look like Mickey Mouse molecules, Mickey, upside down Mickey Mouse heads. So if water molecules always kind of have this shape, and the shape is really just three atoms stuck together, then they must be stuck together in very specific ways. So uh, a bond is directional. That's what that means. So the shared electrons are most stable between the atoms, which makes sense. So these electrons are being, uh, are they're negative electrons, and they're happy right in between these two atoms because this is a positive nucleus and this is a positive nucleus. And the negative electrons like being next to positive things. So they like being next to two positive things right in the middle. So um, that means that covalent compounds have a shape. The bonds are directional. Covalent compounds mo are molecules. We call them molecules. They have shapes.
Um, what holds molecules together, if we look again, I draw a water molecule here. What holds a water molecule to another water molecule in a piece of ice, for example, when water is frozen and the water molecules are stuck together, there is an attraction between this O and this H right here. Right here, there's an attraction. So this attraction holds the water molecules together. It's pretty weak. So what that means is that molecules are held together. The atoms are held together by bonds that are very strong. The atoms are held together by these covalent bonds where this there's an electron here and there's an electron here and they're being shared. And so that makes this bond very, very strong. But this bond, there's these guys are not sharing electrons. There's no covalent bond in between this H and this O. So when I have ice, and I have water, two water molecules or lots of water molecules stuck together because it's an ice cube. The bond that holds this water molecule to this one is not very strong. In fact, I only have to heat the ice up to 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 33 degrees Fahrenheit before this bond starts to break. So then the, uh, this water molecule would be free to kind of move around this water molecule. And that would then the ice would turn into water when this bond breaks. So that's called a melting point. When I have something solid like ice and I break whatever bond is holding the solid pieces together and then suddenly it melts and it turns into a liquid. So this bond in water in ice is pretty weak. So in fact in all covalent compounds where the atoms are sharing electrons the bonds between the molecules and covalent compounds are generally pretty weak. So that means that the melting point of covalent compounds is usually pretty low. They have low melting points. Like water has a really low melting point. It melts at uh, zero degrees Celsius. Chocolate has a higher melting point. Um, I don't know how high exactly, but I know that chocolate can melt on a hot day so 90 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere around there, 100 degrees Fahrenheit is where chocolate melts, right? And water melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So the, those are both covalent compounds. And so they have melting points that are based on the stickiness in between the molecules. The chocolate molecules, this bond must be stronger. In water molecules, this bond is weaker. So ionic bonds are different. In an ionic bond, they are not directional. So remember ionic compounds, they're not sharing any electrons. So it, when, I, when we draw this compound that we drew before, magnesium, this is a cation, and here's B, R minus, and here's B, R minus, I can draw it so that it kind of looks like the upside down Mickey Mouse water molecule, right? H2O. But H2O always has this shape because these bonds are stuck. These electrons that are being shared are stuck. It cannot move, always has this shape. These uh, atoms in this ionic compound this has to, this bromide ion has to stay close to magnesium because this is minus and this is plus and minus and plus are stuck together like magnets so the bromine this magnet has to be close to this one they because they're sticky like magnets and this one has to be close too because this has a two plus charge and in order for this whole thing to become neutral it has to have two minuses so the two plus and the two minuses get close together and then this is kind of uh, 
uh, a, a neutral particle because all those charges will cancel out. So what has to happen is that minus has to be close to plus, but they don't have to have any specific shape. So for example, this one could move up here. So now that one moved up here. B R minus. It can't get very far away from magnesium. It's stuck to it like a magnet, but it can move up there. All right, and now look. Now this one has a different shape. And then this one could move over here. It can't move very far away from the magnesium, but it can change positions a little bit because it has its own sphere. They're not sharing any electrons, so it moves independently of the magnesium. These, mag these spheres move independently. So the shape of a magnesium, of, of an ionic compound, can change. The shape of an ionic compound can change. The bromide could be over here, the bromide could be over there. The bromide could be really close. Maybe it looks like this, or I've got a, brom a bromine over here and another bromine that's really close like this. So maybe this one moves all the way over here. Now it's over here, right? So, right, the, the, the distance between the nucleus of this bromine, the nucleus of this magnesium, and the nucleus of this bromine, it could be a straight line. Or this magnesium, this bromide ion could move, and it could be maybe a 120 degree angle, or the bromine can move again, and maybe a 90 degree angle, or maybe really small, maybe a 45 degree angle. These bromide atoms, these bromide anions, can move independently of each other and independently of the magnesium. They all have to stay close to each other because they're sticky like magnets, but they move. That can't happen with H. H cannot go this way. That, that doesn't happen. This H cannot get closer to that H. Can't happen. This angle is stuck. They're always stuck. Always have the same shape. So, ionic compounds don't have molecules. When I have all these pluses and all these minuses, they're all kind of floating around in, when it's hot, and then maybe as I cool it down, they come together and get stuck together like magnets, and they create this repeating pattern. It's called a crystal structure. This is a cubic crystal structure. And when they all come together, they release some heat, and we call that the lattice energy. But you can see there's no molecule here. This is I could try to say, okay, well, H2O has this very specific shape. This, maybe this is the NaCl molecule, but it has the same shape as this one, NaCl down here, or this one's NaCl, or this one back here is NaCl. So the fact is, which Na belongs to this Cl? None of them do, and all of them do. There is no directionality, there is no, there, there is no sharing of electrons. They're all just stuck together because they're all pluses and they're all minuses. So, um, whereas the bonds between water molecules and ice are weak, and water has a low melting point, the bonds between ionic compounds are strong. The plus and the minus, that's very strong. So that means that melting salt, if you try to melt table salt, it has a very, very high melting point at about 800 degrees Celsius. But if you try to melt a cube of water, it will melt at zero degrees Celsius. So a cube of salt has a much higher melting point at 800 degrees Celsius because the bonds in between the pluses and the minus are very strong. And the bonds in between the H and the O in water um, are between water molecules are very weak. So um, ions are stuck in a solid, but if I heat them up and I turn them into a liquid, then those ions can move. Again, that takes a lot. This is 800, oops, this is 800 degrees C. But if I add that much heat, then I can turn salt into liquid salt. It becomes molten because it's basically like I'm melting a rock. 
right? Molten. So that means it glows. It's so hot that I've, like when you put a, a iron into a fire, or if you have a, a really hot campfire, you see sometimes the rocks themselves start to glow. That's what happens if you try to melt salt at 800 degrees C. It starts to glow, and it turns into uh, liquid salt, and the ions can move. So when the ions can move, then uh, salt can conduct electricity. So when the ions are stuck in the solid before I melt it, like solid table salt, it can't conduct electricity because those negative and pluses can't move. The particles can't move. They're stuck together. If I melt this salt, the light bulb will turn on because then the pluses and minuses can move. Another way to get the pluses and minuses to move is to add water. If I add water to salt, then the water kind of breaks the pluses and minuses apart. And when they get broken apart, then they can start to move with water molecules surrounding them, kind of keeping them away from each other. So the water molecules can help them move around in the solution. So um, electricity can be conducted in a solution. A solution becomes conductive if electrons can go from one electrode to the other electrode. Electrons are negative particles, part of an atom, and so if there is some way for an electron to hop and then hop and then hop and then hop and then hop and hop its way from one electrode to the other across particles that are positive, then the circuit will be completed and the light bulb will turn on. So over here, the electron can't hop, hop, hop. It can't hop from place to place because all of these pluses are stuck and when the electron gets here on this plus it doesn't have a way to get to this plus because there's a minus in between and the electron is negative and this is negative and so it would just get stuck right there the electron coming into the circuit would get stuck right on that first Na and it couldn't move but here an electron can get onto this Na and then get passed to another Na and then pass to another Na and pass to another Na before it makes it to the electrode so covalent compounds can't do this. Ionic compounds, when they're dissolved or, or liquid, can conduct electricity. When they're solid, they can't. Covalent compounds cannot conduct electricity. Go back. So ionic has charges, right? Pluses and minuses, cations and anions. And that means that it can conduct electricity, conductive, because electricity is made of electrons, and electrons are negative. So if something has charges, those negative electrons can move. But if something is covalent, it doesn't have charges. No charges because the electrons are being shared. There's no charge on H or O when I draw water. The electrons are just being shared. No charges, not conductive. And now you're saying, well, wait a minute, H2O, water, is covalent, and it has no charges, but water is conductive, right? Isn't water conductive? It seems to conduct electricity. You shouldn't go swimming in a lightning storm, right? Well, actually, H2O, by itself, pure H2O, is not conductive. I know that is very surprising to hear, but H2O, when it's a pure liquid and there's nothing in it except H2O molecules, then it does not conduct electricity. But most water, bath water, water in the ocean, water in a lake that you're swimming in, um, almost all water that you find in nature actually looks like this because water is not pure H2O, these little red and gray ones. There's not just water inside of water. There's also salt. There's a little bit of sodium chloride. There's a little bit of magnesium. There's a little bit of fluoride. There's a little bit of lithium. There's a little bit of calcium. There's a little bit of salt, a little bit of cations and anions inside of every single natural water sample. And so we, are accustomed to believe that water is conductive because all of those natural samples of water conduct electricity because all of those natural samples of water look like this 
but if these ions were gone, if that was not in the solution, and that was not in the solution, or that, or that, and the only thing in solution were these water molecules, then the electrons would have nowhere to go because the water molecules are not charged. The electron would try to hop here, and it couldn't. It can't hop onto a water molecule because a water molecule doesn't have any place for a negative electron. So pure water is not conductive unless it has salt in it. And salt is just another word for ions, unless there are ions. And when there are ions in the water, then it is conductive. So in your bathtub, there are ions that come out of your faucet. Um, so you shouldn't, shouldn't take a bath while charging your iPhone, because the water is conductive.